So now this is a huge you know, topic, lessons from the brain for enhancing computing and learning capabilities of spike neural networks. Um, during the last 30 years, hundreds of people literally have been working on this busily, right? You know, there are probably not just thousands, tens of thousands of publications. So it's not so easy to summarize this. And I resisted the temptation to give an overview of the literature but I rather simply want to illustrate the process and the state of the art in, in two examples. Um, and this, both of these examples are also available now on the web, so you can read further. And also this lecture will be put on YouTube. Uh, but you also can send me email or ask for my slides before something will be on the web. So these are results of uh, extremely intelligent people in my team. Uh, Guillaume Belek, Franz Scheer, Anand Supramoni, Darjan Sala, Elias Hacek, all PhD students, and Professor Robert Legenstein. And actually, also, there are openings in our team if you find this work interesting. And you know, we get mainly funding from HPP. But as you see, also companies you know, are interested in these topics. Uh, the two main sources for reading further results are these two, and they're really rather recent, right? Now this one only was you know, last month put on the web. So the dream of neuromorphic computing of neuro robotics is you now uh, to take port models of spike neurons into neuromorphic hardware, enable neuromorphic hardware to operate in a similar, similar energy efficient regime as the brain. And as you probably know, the brain is estimated to consume less than 20 watt, although it has as many, about as many active no, computing elements as a supercomputer. Supercomputer consumes 10 megawatt, so energy consumption is a real problem for supercomputing. But also, if you read, for example, no, in technology about no, aut fully autonomously driving cars, no, level five, no, there are many no, problems that have to be solved, but one of them is the computing they have to be do would re require too much energy, which cannot really provide it for a car then. So therefore, also for there, you know, really to come up with computing hardware, which is drastically more energy efficient, is a real necessity in order to realize this. So then, of course, you know, there is this more intellectual dream, enable neuromorphic hardware to produce the same intelligence as a brain. Um, there is a more tangible uh, goal namely enable neuromorphic hardware to approximate the performance of artificial networks in current machine learning and in, uh, and in I, uh, artificial intelligence. I'm not sure whether you follow the literature in these areas. I really do recommend that you do this. If you cannot read all these no, hundreds of new papers each year, you might want, for example, to look at the web page of Google DeepMind, you know, where they put most of their results out you know, in publications, often very readable ones. Uh, and I think this gives you an idea now where we are and where we are moving then. And if you see there, for example, no, there no, have no, also methods, for example, for training artificial neural networks to solve human intelligence tasks, no, Raven's progressive matrices. So one is really approaching there, no, the level almost of brain intelligence. And cracking brain intelligence is, as you know, one of the stated goals of human of the Deep Mind Lab you know, in, in London there, right? So they're not, at least no state, as stated, not about really making money, but really solving really a fundamental scientific problem. And they have hundreds of people working on this, some of the probably the most talented junior people among them in the world. And one has to take seriously what their output. One cannot simply say, we do neuromorphic engineering. We have to, no, we, this is not our business, right? This is really the competition out there. And if neuromorphic engineering doesn't get to a similar level as these guys, no, it will just be a university kind of activity, but really doesn't make it in the real world then. So therefore, I think it's really essential that you also face really the competition or challenge there. Um, and uh, not just happy with you not know, doing something, and in the end, if it doesn't work well, you say it's at least it's brain-like, right? No, this is the most common excuse for bad performance. So, how far are we currently supporting models of spike neurons you know, from neuroscience neuromorphic hardware? You know, there are many groups and companies that have do this, um, also enable neuromorphic hardware to operate in an energy-efficient regime. 
know, many groups are working on this, but what really has changed the field quite a bit is in recent years, the industrial giants have entered the field. In particular, Intel has now put out the chip Louis, I think it was not two years ago, uh, which is not only very energy efficient, but also has on-chip learning then. Um, and they uh, will produce during this year now uh, a board which has hundreds of these Louis chips, uh, about 60 million neurons. Uh, so therefore, they're really now making a lot of progress. And for them, I think the main uh, problem is really you know, to find algorithms for using this new hardware then. Um, and so we are challenged you now to provide this. Um, and also they do this in a nice world well at Intel. They have now created uh, their own research community which meets regularly uh, and you might want to look you know, um, into this. So this INRC it's called. IBM has also done a lot of, lot of work on this but this is a bit more in-house work which engages less the community. Um, so as um, I would argue you know, that you know, produce same intelligence as a brain it has become hard to distinguish this goal from the one really you know, to just you know, compete with current AI in machine learning. Um, and, but now I think what really is happening now th in these years is <coughs> that we're getting close to really creating a pipeline where we can take results uh, from uh, deep learning, um, from, from also deep mind lab, uh, and really see how they can be mapped onto neuromorphic hardware. We no longer have to stay in our corner of neuromorphic you now um, playing on our own games. But also what we see, and this is something I want to bring across in my talk, is really, you know, while here uh, taking the challenge from modern AI seriously, uh, it actually helps to go back and actually uh, look again what the brain provides us. And I will show you that it really helps you know, to look in more details and the models of spike neurons, particular types of spike neurons, which Dr. Murray has just introduced. Um, and it turns out that this uh, really helps also from the performance perspective. It not just makes it more biological. So I will center my talk of one generic task for an agent. And at, you know, we have chosen it somewhat to be you know, both in some sense of a type which you want to have a robot not to uh, do, but also it's actually taken from biology. So in the tank lab at Princeton, they had developed uh, some years ago a virtual reality setup for, uh, for mice then, where they can ro record from the n mice while they sit there in a particular position, but they're virtually they're moving in a world then. And so therefore they can record from this animals while they're really solving tasks like this then. And you know, for most of these tasks, uh, one needs that the number of um, capabilities need to be present then. And here this is you know, integrate sensor information over time, wait for the right moment to act, not just be you know, reflexive. And also that of course choose in the end the action that is most likely to be rewarded, you know, decision making. And you know, this uh, video um, is really uh, yeah. is illustrating you know, this task. So there is a rodent, and they are on a linear track. And while they move along, uh, they see you know, their cues flashing on the left and right. You know, then they have to cover some delay. Now they come to a decision point. And now they have to decide, go left or right then. Um, and now. The, the animals are not told what is really decision policy. They have to find this out. And you know, what secretly you know, was, has been chosen you know, in published papers about this task is that you, know, the, you install a rule where you just you count the cues from the right and the cues from the left. And if there were more cues from the right, you know, then uh, the animal should you know, make a right turn here. So this sounds easy, but no, look at the brain has no idea what is relevant, right? They could just think the side of the most recent queue was relevant, right? Or the side of the two most recent queues, or it was important that there were two adjacent queues from the same side, right? So there are zillions of possible rules, right? And now picking a rule which gets rewarded is actually a non-trivial decision-making task on its own then. But uh, there are you no know, additional challenges, and I th this become apparent 
if we look really at the way how our would solve such a ta task you know, in current machine learning using, using artificial neural networks, where you know, this is not really a particular challenge to solve this task. But what one sees actually is that you know, in machine learning, you would, ne would need two ingredients uh, which are so far not really present in uh, spike neural networks, especially in the neuromorphic hardware. One is you know, that they're they do re use recurrent networks, like you know, in the biological paradigm, but these are not networks of sigmoidal neurons, or as one says, rate-based neurons, but they are uh, networks of a very peculiar type of unit, so-called long short-term memory units, LSTM units. And this was you know, published now over 20 years ago. For a while it was very little cited, but you see now it really there is an explosion of interest in this in recent years, you know, along with this explosion of results in uh, machine learning then. Um, and so th we have to take this seriously. It looks from the biological perspective like a real hack then, but look at it, what it has then. The, L the main component of an LSTM unit is its memory cell. And there you can um, think of it as an ad register. You can put a bit there or a number and this number stays there un unless you want to change it. And decisions about changing these numbers are made by some sigmoidal gates, which have weights like all sigmoidal gates, and these are trained in some sense to, to provide access, refreshment to this memory cell, but also for outputting the current content there. Um, and so therefore, you think of it like a digital register, like in a computer, but you know, the access to this digital register is really learning based and it's not constructed, constructed by an engineer. This would be too difficult in this context actually. So the second component which actually does then you know, the training of the weights of these exit, excess gates is you know, backpropagation through time and the name comes from you know, in the end you're doing backpropagation, you're applying gradient descent for a loss function. I will discuss more of this. Uh, in the end, now you apply just no chain rule, which we have all learned in school then. But no, if you apply to recurrent neural networks, there is an, is an additional nasty feature because you really have to now first do the computation in recurrent networks. These are time steps. And then you have to afterwards go back in time then with computing gradients then. So therefore, backpropagation through time it really means backwards in time, going from step t to t minus 1 back into the past then. So both of these looked for many years as something which are simply no obstacles um, and we can't really climb to this level of performance with spike neural networks. But no, they're good news uh, that uh, one has found uh, ways to emulate LSTM uh, units and also backpropagation through time um, with kind of mechanisms which are well known from biology and which turn out to actually work very well in neuromorphic hardware. Um, and both of these uh, mechanisms, uh, they rely on something which Dr. Maureen alluded to a bit, uh, but it's something which is commonly ignored. And then if you read really a book about uh, chemistry, bi biochemistry of neurons, you learn that there are um, many different signaling chains, uh, cascades, which for in particular process uh, information about the history of cal calcium influx into the neuron then. Uh, but their process are many different time scales going in the, in the end you know, to the time scale of you know, re reading the neural code and creating uh, new proteins, uh, putting channels uh, into the membrane there. And in all this models that you see in textbooks for spiking neurons, you don't find you know, this slow dynamical process is typically represented because uh, one has had usually viewed this as some biological peculiarities, uh, but they're not that relevant for the function, for the particularly not for the computational function of these neurons. And this view has changed uh, over the last few years, and I want to uh, describe this to you first for the case of LSTM units and then for backpropagation through time. <coughs> yeah, so um, I will come back here to this um, slide which Dr. Marine had shown, different types of neurons as you find them in nature. 
and I highlighted here four of these which have a particular property. So this is the neuron which really responds. Uh, these are actually all neurons which respond according to the textbook. You give them a constant input current and then they uh, respond with a constant firing rate. But look at this one here. This initially it has a much fire, higher firing rate than in the end. This has the same but even stops firing at all and these are somewhere in between. But it's common that after a while, although the input current stays constant, they fire less and less. Um, and so this is often uh, called you know, firing rate adaptation uh, in, in neuroscience studies. And if you look at the brain atlas of the Allen Institute, which I highly recommend, you know, a web page simply, you can get an overview over you know, how many neurons you know, have this dynamic property in which parts of the brain. And if you look, for example, this firing rate adaptation, you know, it's measured by an adaptation index. If it has adaptation index zero, it's of this type. There's no firing rate adaptation. And you see, for example, in the dark green bar, these are the results from the human frontal lobe. And you see 60% no, of the neurons there have no firing rate adaptation, which means 40% actually have this yellowish kind of behavior. They do have this adaptation. And you see this actually more in the human fr frontal lobe than in the mouse visual cortex. So one could conjecture also that if you do more demanding cognitive operations that possibly these uh, mechanisms you know, is useful, as least evolution has you know, found that this might be useful there. So this is now just uh, the statistics. Um, one can create a very simple model for adapting neurons. You know, there are many neurons, uh, models for adapting neurons in literature. Um, and you know, often fitted to data. But uh, here you now, this model, which we call ALIF for adaptive leaky integrated fire neuron, is you know, perhaps you know, the simplest possible way of modeling this firing rate adaptation effect. And basically, it amounts to this. You know, you know, as Dr. Maureen explained, you, know, you have this membrane potential, and when it crosses uh, a firing threshold, you know, the neuron fires. And in the most simple models, you simply have a fixed firing threshold. But in the more complex models, you always have then um, a history-dependent firing threshold. AJ of T is a firing threshold for neuron J then. So this has this lower case AJ is you know, this dynamic component of the uh, firing threshold. And typically, you know, this firing threshold um, goes up for these adapting neurons when the neuron fires. Uh, and then it decays uh, exponentially or so in between there. So this is you no. Know, this background hidden variable. And so from a mathematical perspective, the main feature is you know, that adapting neurons have two hidden values, two hidden parameters. One is the membrane potential, and one is uh, another one is this firing threshold. Um, the third you know, variable which describes a neuron is you know, the spike train simply, which I write in my talk as Z. So this is simply no zero or one, one when the neuron fires at time t, otherwise zero. And so this is the uh, only observable variable you know, for a spiking neuron in the network. Now, it's something extremely simple you know, to add uh, models for these you know, Aleph neurons into SNN. But it turns out that it really provides a qualitative jump in the perform computational performance of these networks. And so we have in a paper which appeared you know, in last NURIPS, um, <coughs> tested this for a number of benchmark tasks like speech recognition timid and one sees that you no know, if include inducting neurons then spiking neurons suddenly get close to LSTM networks so simply to the frontier in machine learning then and so this is something which I have not seen in the previous you know, decades of our work uh, with spiking neurons so therefore we do have now a chance to really uh, to become um, compatible competitive uh, with this work in machine learning. And because you know, this variation of spike neural networks, LSNN, so we stole the L from LSTM units you know, because they also have long, shorter memory. But I think what's interesting is really if you compare the simplicity of this mechanism with the complexity of the LSTM cell, it's really you know, astounding, right, you know, that with such a simple device, uh, you can know, approximate you know, the computational power of having LSTM units. Um, one thing also on the side is 
I think one thing that does not work, neither for LSDM units nor for adaptive neurons, uh, you cannot engineer recurrent networks which contain these units. So I think uh, apparently you know, their use within the network is rather complicated and it has to be configured through a learning process. Uh, and so therefore, you know, this, both of these types of you know, more demanding you know, uh, units require also network learning um, method which is able to configure the recurrent network to put them in the right place then. You know, we're occurring you now, many groups are working now on really trying to re-engineer you know, what these learning algorithms do and I think in a few years we may have some portable insights but at the moment it's, it's a black box how exactly they're used in the network except for extremely simple computing tasks. And um, no, when I don't want to emphasize you know, that you have these adaptive neurons in there, I simply write RS and N you know, for recurrent um, spike neural networks. So you now back propagation through time. This is, you know, I think, from the perspective of machine learning, the only method really which is enabled to really to unleash the power of LSTM units. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it's really in some the version of, of backprop of gradient descent. But you know, if you look at it for a moment, from a mathematical perspective, you can apply gradient descent only to a feed forward network. So if you have now a recurrent network which has recurrent connections between i and j and many loops there, you first need to conceptually replace this recurrent network by really long chain um, of, of feed forward layers then. We are now, instead of having you no know, connections between these two units i and j, you have no uh, synaptic connections which really connect the copy of this whole network at step t minus one to the copy of again the whole network at time t then right and in this through this mathematical trick you can pretend you're working with a feed forward network um, what I want to say is this the resulting depth of this feed forward ne network really becomes typically you know, a few thousand right when you typical computation or behavior lasts a few seconds and you need to have one time step resolution to really track spikes uh, and so therefore you get into the really deep depths and this is no reason why we're somewhere no entangled with no deep learning methods there. Uh, so the question uh, we had addressed then uh, in our work now which uh, came out now this year is <coughs> how can possibly this back propagation of gradients backwards in time uh, be emulated by something in the brain which doesn't do this. So I think this is not really an option for implementing this you know, biologically. And it turned out that if we really look a little bit further into the biological literature, one sees that there are two types of signals which are very well known and documented but have not so much been looked at in this particular context. Uh, although in some sense you no know, eligib eligibility traces have been considered in various forms typically for reinforcement learning in a somewhat different context than I'm aiming at here then um, and so this you know, are motivated by this observation that there are these slow dynamic processes uh, in neurons and synapses so if you want to pick a concrete one you can look at the autophosphorylation of CAMK2 you know, one of the enzymes which is you know, a link between which um, kind of connects current events integration of information of current events into more longer lasting effects uh, in the going back into also synaptic plasticity one other one is that there really is a host of learning or error signals I call them L in the following uh, many different forms. So you may have heard of dopamine, but there are many other neural modulators. One knows also that uh, plasticity is gated by disinhibition of a local network, um, or simply they also know apparently neurons you know that accompany error-related negativity. So I find this you know, paper from this year particularly interesting because it shows you know, really that there are circuits in the brain that do performance monitoring and you know, the output and you know, the results of this performance monitoring are really transmitted via, via spikes to other networks there. So I think this is you know, an architectural uh, kind of you know, component which has not been you know, used so much. And you know, even for the well-known dopamine effect, you know, recently 
by a new message really came out. So this is a Nature paper from this year from the Witten Lab in, in uh, Princeton. And they had been working many years and taking a closer look what exactly is the output of dopaminergic neuron technically in the area VTA, which projects to prefrontal cortex. And one found out it's not a single kind of so-called global signal, but rather this uh, area projects many different variations of these dopamine signals to different parts of prefrontal cortex, and probably also not other parts of the brain get really more individualized uh, signals, top-down signals. And so this looks to me like really now a disruptive process in thinking about the role of neuromodulators that it's no longer one signal, but it's lots of different signals. And for us, you no know, algorithm designers or theoreticians, the challenge arises to make sense out of this. And um, our you know, proposal to make sense out of this is you no know, mathematics. So one can show that you know, the key derivative that one has to compute for backpropagation through time, which is you know, this derivative, which says, how does a loss function of a network change if you, you know, increase this weight, which goes from neuron i to j then. And the result is that you can write this key term, which tells you, you know, how to change this weight as a sum over time of, two of a product of two terms, where this is a local eligibility trace, which can be computed at the neuron you know, j then. It takes only the, you know, the firing of neuron i into account, account at its own firing. It can ignore the rest of the network, so it's very neuromorphic hardware friendly. And this is a top-down signal uh, for the neuron J then. So this you could think of this, for example, as the dopamine signal you know, which reaches neuron J at time t. Uh, a key point is really this is a sum over t, and you know, the resulting learning rule, which we call EPROP, suggests to simply apply the following simple online learning rule at time t, change this weight from i to j according to the negative of this term then, of this sum then. So this is now something which really is a complete different nature, obviously, than backpropagation through time because this is really an online learning rule. And it's somewhat surprising that you can actually approximate quite a bit of the computational or learning power of backpropagation through time in this online fashion. So there had been you know, kind of algorithmic attempts in earlier, you know, last century even, or recurrent time, recur RTRL, uh, real time recurrent learning. But this hasn't been used much because this has blown up the computation complexity from n squared to n to the fourth then. Whereas this is now a method which asymptotically requires only as many computation steps than the, sim the simulation of the RNN. So this is not the absolute minimum from the perspective of computation complexity. So therefore, it's something that can really apply them. Now, if one looks, you know, take a closer look at this term, the ideal value for the learning signal is how would the uh, loss function of the network be affected if you make if, you, if this neuron spikes at time t then. Um, and so this is something which unfortunately is not available at time t generally because this comes because often you know, in a more tricky task like the one that I have shown, only when this mouse reaches the end of this corridor, you know, there's a supervisor which tells you, you know, this decision was right or wrong. So this means this learning signal has value zero most of the time because there is not even a target output, right, until to the very end. And so this means it's really a challenge then if you, whereas, you know, this here would simply integrate over time the complete loss function. Uh, and so this could also implicitly provide some back propagation in time. But we, I'm insisting here on online learning there. And I will show you that this can be approximated by an online learning signal, which can be produced at time t without looking into the future. So in the end, you know, the type of learning rule that then arises you know, from this mathematical analysis is something which integrates you know, spiking activity, similar as you know, SCDP. You now you have you know, the presynaptic neuron I fires and then postsynaptic neuron fires. Um, then the membrane potential goes up, but also the eligibility trace goes up then. And the key point is that, you know, for example, if this is the whole time of, this, of a single trial, only here at the end, you, know, you reach you know, 
uh, this decision point then and only then the learning signal is non-zero. Uh, the key point is that the eligibility trace is still non-zero at this time. So therefore the link between the early comp computing steps which have to be learned, say what to do with all these flashes there, uh, <coughs> have to leave a trace you know, until the very end when learning signals come which gives some cue what to do with these earlier things then. So I don't really think you want to see this, but you can look it up also in the paper. It really shows you know, how to arrive at this learning rule. So this is the key gradient, and this is how you arrive at this. And mathematically, you know, one can check it actually, and you know, it has actually a mathematical trivial operation. If you just look at these two summations, this has the second summation into the future if t prime is your current time point. By simply interchanging the order of these two sums, no, this is now real time at time t what to do and this only looks back into the past then. So this is now at a very no, simplistic level a key component interchanging these two sums then. <coughs> and one sees also you know, how these two terms arise. So this is here this learning signal at for time t for neuron j and this is really uh, which tracks what is the impact of neuron of the weight no, to the internal state of the neuron at time t prime, then you, know, you have evolution of the neural state still of the same neuron j, it's still a completely local process, and in the end the question is whether this internal state makes the neuron spike at time t then, at a later time point. So this really becomes then you know, what is the ideal version of the eligibility trace then. There's also something you know, tricky in here, if no, you have not seen this, it's actually surprising. How can you apply it all gradient descent methods to spiking networks? And this arises because uh, colleagues you know, at IBM and you know, in the Benjo lab uh, realized in 2016 that you know, this is something which, which here you know, is a partial derivative. How does spiking depend on internal variables? And this is something which mathematically if you now look at what Dr. Marine had shown, requires the derivation of a step function. And it turned out simply by replacing this you know, non-differentiable function or simply plugging in a pseudo derivative really uh, enables these networks to learn surprisingly well then. And so this has been mostly used for uh, feed forward networks, but it also works if you really choose this very carefully for recurrent networks where functionally you're working in really deep you know, feed-forward networks. So therefore, it's essential that this is really well chosen. So let me then you know, show you what is then the dynamics of this. And so keep in mind, we want to get rid of this backwards propagation in time step. And you know, uh, the goal is now, or the replacement is, we do a little bit more work during the forward computation because we update this local eligibility traces here now indicated in, green, in the blue then. So therefore, this is the key now trade-off. Uh, we want, in order to get rid of the back propagation through time, we do a little bit more local kind of now, uh, history updating uh, during the forward just the computation, just the usual computation of the network. And now, <coughs> It turns out that actually this uh, EPROP is something which currently in its is implemented in Spinnaker, so it, it's, it takes some work then for taking reason, and also we collaborating with Intel in implementing in the next version of the LOEHI chip. Then for some you know, kind of benign, seemingly benign technical reasons, it cannot be implemented on the current one, but they agree there's no obstacles really for implementing it. One just has to foresee some simple things then. Um, so in order to understand now how one can solve now this function here, so maybe actually I should speed up somewhat here um, because I think, let's see, I started five minutes late, right? I should probably stop around 45 to 50 then. Yeah, so let me then actually speed up. So there is now some mystery now how really to deal with this loss function, which is really something which contains a sum also over future time points. And it turns out that you can replace this ideal learning signal by something which is very simple. You just look at what is the current kind of 
difference between a target signal and the actual output and you multiply it with a random weight then. So this is borrowed from broadcast alignment, a method which you know, has been proposed for feed forward networks recently. And so I have now a movie for the performance for this task that I have shown. And so maybe before you see the movie, so this is here a summary of the results. So this is the decision error at the end. So you can't be worse than a 0.5 here. And so this is what you get when you don't use adaptive neurons. You take you no know, recurrent networks of spike neurons. You apply the most powerful learning method. We know back propagation through time, but still it can't do the, it can't solve it, right? Whereas if you apply back propagation through time to an LSNN, so a network which has adaptive neurons, it learns it here, say, after 250 training iterations. And so this is now the performance curve uh, for EPROP, uh, which is an online method. So one needs, it needs about twice as many training iterations, but it arrives at the same uh, performance in the end then. And so this is, you know, in the end now, remember, you know, this kind of the learning rule which applies uh, is this online learning rule. And so this is you now a video for illustrating um, the dynamics of EPROP while this mouse is running. So let me actually hold here this for a <coughs> moment to explain some of what you're seeing here. So one sees here then uh, that no, it gets, you know, the cues are provided to this network in the form of spike, spikes from certain populations of neurons. It gets some noise input. Then you have you know, the reg usual type of firing neurons, and you have here some also um, some uh, adaptive neurons. Then, and they have these <coughs> eligibility traces, and you know, this epsilon is a factor for these. And you see here, you know, this factor for the regular firing neurons you know, doesn't have much duration. But you see already here this greenish part; it really stretches more into the future. So one can now argue that for, from the perspective of learning that these eligibility traces provide no highways into the future. So let me see what's happening and also let's no, notice that. So this is here uh, the line where the learning signals are produced then and there is no learning signal yet. We see it only arises here because only then there's a target output and then you have a chance to make a wrong decision, right? No, so far there's no challenge really for decision making. Now the decision making time comes um, and then it's over then, right? So this now going backwards and now you see here this learning rule has to combine these two things, these here which only active at the very end and this E traces which are barely still existing there, right? But you also see they only exist for adaptive neurons. There's nothing left really for lift neurons. This model lives too much in the present then. And so therefore now the product of this is non-zero here and then here, you know, the softmax output you know, converges to the right uh, place. Maybe we c if you have some questions to this, we could address it here. Hmm. Otherwise, I would quickly now move on. So this is here you now for simplicity. For simplicity, I have you now modeled here this as a supervised learning task. One can also mo model this as a reward-based learning task, but it takes you now it's it's you know, mo technically more difficult. I don't want to get into this. You need to then um, to train the network also produce a value function and estimate of future rewards uh, and you integrate this estimate of the value function or rather the temporal difference error into this top-down learning signal L then. So let me then jump to the end. So where are we regarding capabilities and neuromorphic implementations of spike neural networks? So at the moment, now we are optimistic you now that whenever we have tested this for publications, you no know, recent machine learning and AI, the back propagation through time was applies to LSTM networks. We see one can port this to spiking networks, EPROP apply to LSNNs. You have some loss in performance, but this is typically benign. It's on the order of a few percent typically, and it may you know, be become less if one really tunes these methods more than. So therefore, one can now at the moment uh, produce you no know, spike-based AI in this way, and also you can make neuromorphic robot controller much more powerful because you simply can look at you know, what does what games study, what 
strategies DeepMind provides for game planning in really demanding games, and you have now a principled method for porting this to spiking networks. Um, so also you know, from the more te technical perspective, you know, one new twist is that we have um, you extensively use TensorFlow to implement spike neural networks just because TensorFlow gives you this gradient uh, descent machinery for free then, also for LSNNs. Otherwise, it would be really very cumbersome. And also, in um, L Intel, no, Louis, they have provided a TensorFlow-based model for the chip, then also for the learning of the chip. It's not yet published. So therefore, TensorFlow seems to become an interface between the algorithm designer and extra neuromorphic hardware uh, implementations then. So in addition to these ideas that I sketched, there is no, there's one other challenge. You know, if you look at you know, results in current you know, machine learning, if there's vision involved, they use CNNs, you often really deep and large CNNs. And uh, in, uh, one this can also be ported to spiking networks. Again, you have some loss in performance, but it's not dramatic then. And again, it's on the order of 10% or so on, on benchmark data sets like CIFAR. Uh, and then man also get closer. So therefore, at the moment, one can really put into Lui or this new cluster of Lui, uh, really implement powerful machine learning methods <coughs> there, and in the end apply this to neuromorphic, rob um, to neuro robotics there. I would also like to add you know, that if one works on this very general level, then where you design a loss function, you can also add regularizer terms to this loss function, for example, that you want that the network fires only sparsely, then you don't want to work in a firing rate you know, coding regime of the network, because then this network would fire so much that this energy consumption approximates you know, the one of a regular network. So we typically, you know, so far we have uh, induced these networks to work with not more than 10 hertz firing rates, one can probably drive it lower. And it's very interesting to look now at these neural codes that these networks learn to use then, because as far as we can see, it's none of these coding schemes which Dr. Maureen had discussed at the end of the time to the first spike or end coding. So apparently there is more room for really spike-based computing, which nature has found, and we have to duplicate. And the only instantiations we at the moment can produce is really through powerful learning machineries. Um, and my uh, more guess is that these you know, networks use really sp spatial temporal spike patterns then of several neurons rather than simple schemes like timing to first spike, which is conceptually very clean, but the network finds simply so many different ways of making use of temporal information. So this was all. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm.